Good Monday morning! Today I would like to talk about the life cycle of software from the point when you write your very first line of code as a lone developer to when you have hundreds and thousands of lines of code and a big team and later. I am MPJ and you are watching Fun Fun Function. So the big problem that is going to run through this musing is that complexity grows over time. As software developers, the fact that software complexity grows over time, that is the single most important challenge and, and job as a software developer, managing that constantly growing complexity. I've been a software developer for a pretty long time, um, like 10 to 12, 12 years. During my career, I have uh, grown through I think four phases uh, that uh, in how I relate to the, ever, the problem of ever-growing complexity in software. My first phase was rewrites. When you are starting out as a developer, you, you like to write code. You just write code and you, oh, I want to add a feature and you add a feature and you eventually end up with this mountain of, of mess that is just so entangled and hard to deal with and nobody wants to work in it and eventually you decide that oh we have made so many mistakes we, we're just gonna rewrite this thing in the right way this time and that never ever 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 have worked for me that has always every time i have been involved in a rewrite or when i have taken the initiative to do a rewrite it has been a mistake and been a bad thing every single time I've already done a video on why rewrites don't work. You can find it here in the uh, in the upper right corner or clicking in the episode description or reading uh, Joel Spolsky's excellent article on it. Uh, I've linked that in the episode description too. My second phase was managing tech debt. Uh, that was the phase that came after <laughs> banging my head against the rewrite mistake enough times. Uh, but I've actually also made another episode on on managing tech debt here. But basically, in my my tech debt phase, I um, I, I spent time with constantly managing uh, the the level of tech debt that that arose. Like as uh, as development went on, uh, you you need to uh, constantly clean up after yourself and. Uh, rethink how is, is this still the way we should structure this application or have things changed do we need to move things around and 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 clean things up and restructure that kind of thing to make your software workable the problem is that even if you manage tech debt perfectly complexity is still going to grow in your application over time because there are two kinds of complexity. There's accidental complexity and there is essential complexity. Accidental complexity is uh, complexity that you you create. That's basically complexity that you write in code. It's, uh, it's when you write code a little bit more messy than you could have. It's not as clean as it could have. Uh, and there might be an abstraction that is unnecessary or you might have added a cache that didn't really have to be there. That's accidental complexity. On the other hand, you have essential complexity and that's not really related to how you write your code, but related to the problem that your software is trying to solve. Code might be complicated because the problem that it's trying to solve is complicated. Writing a text editor, that is a big complicated problem. Like there's only so you cannot, there's, you can only make the code so simple. And as months and years go by and you add feature after feature and setting after setting and some of them are intermingled, complexity in your project is inevitably going to grow. Because even though you manage your, you do a very good work at managing your tech depth and your accidental complexity goes down and you keep that stable, the essential complexity will just grow and grow and grow and grow. 
So after this realization that tech debt only takes you so far, I went into phase three. Phase three is removing features. My reasoning in this phase was that because we were constantly adding features and, and settings and stuff, uh, and that was inevitably increasing our complexity of the software, no matter what we did with tech debt, we also had to remove features, the, the ones that were least used from our software as a kind of hygienic thing. So in the teams I worked with, uh, I became kind of like this grim reaper where I was just constantly pushing that we should remove features and, uh, and, and remove this setting is not necessary. We should decide if on one default and just make that the, the only condition. And to a certain extent that actually worked. I, we managed to identify a lot of features that had very low usage and at the same time had a very high maintenance cost. And uh, we, we got those out of the product. And as we did, we did end up with more, uh, more maintainable code. Removing them did increase the, the speed and quality of, of the software in total. However, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't work because removing features takes a long time, a surprisingly long time, and like many, many times longer than you intuitively anticipate them to. And because it's so slow uh, and adding features is so fast, uh, that means that the ever-growing tide of complexity will outpace uh, the, the, uh, the speed that you will be able to remove it. The reason why uh, removing features is so surprisingly hard is mainly related to the fact that it's such ungrateful work. You are never going to see like this big ass cool event where the CEO of a company says, yes, we have removed and cleaned out these three underperforming features and everybody will go like uh, applause. No, there will like the people that benefit from it uh, by the slight development increase in speed, they will not care because it's just too ephemeral of a benefit. And the people that actually did use this feature will like go because you have essentially destroyed a little bit of their life. Therefore, doing this work of culling the least performing features in, in an application, it's not going to be very popular. It's not going to get a lot of resources and employees are not going to be terribly excited about doing it. It's also just very complicated work. Uh, the feature is often entangled into the product in many interesting elaborate ways. And you also have to do a lot of research on on how this is being used by what users on what clients and figure out interesting migration paths and you have to work with customer service to figure out how to uh, how to communicate it the removal and doing the timing of it so removing features are uh, hard slow ungrateful work uh, you will never be able to remove features in even close to the same pace as uh, they are being added so Again, complexity just keeps growing. I'm now entering my fourth phase of understanding uh, where I, I think that software must eventually be allowed to die. Once I was asked to sit in on an interview with a, um, a, a product manager and I, um, I asked them why how do you deal with this problem? And their answer was interesting in that they didn't think that they had a solution. The, the way that uh, they had dealt with the problem in one instance was simply that the old product, they just let it sit there. And uh, meanwhile, they developed a new product, not a rewrite of the old product. No, this was a completely new product based on the realities that they had now as a company as opposed to the realities that they had when they started the development of the old product 10 years ago uh, and they just gradually over time over the years 
migrated people from this old product to the new product by finding little things that uh, were missing in order to get the laggers behind uh, and eventually almost all uh, customers had moved to the to the new product. Uh, there were some people that just never never did uh, did leave the old product and eventually you, they they basically had to let those customers go. But I just that was a bit of a revelation for me and I've been thinking about it for a long time and I think that that might be the way that thing things have to go. There is a software called Fogbugs built by uh, a company called Fog Creek. Um, it's uh, the people that has been involved in making Stack Exchange. Fogbugs, it, it's the kind of software, you know, when you use it, it's, it's just... How do I put this? It smells 1997. Do you know, <laughs> can you relate to that at all? Like just the software just smells of a certain certain year of, of development era. And I think that the people at, at Fog Creek, they, they realized that they, that the, something was eventually going to give with this thing. And they, um, so the, but they also had the wisdom of that rewrites don't work. And they ended up building a product called Trello. And Trello was massively successful and you probably know about it and uh, but you didn't really care about Fog Creek or Fogbugs. Trello is a completely different product from Fogbugs. It's it, it's not even a bug tracking system. It's just basically some kind of structured whiteboard kind of thing. You could not have possibly achieved that by doing a rewrite or by removing features or refactoring things or doing things gradually. It's just a completely new thing. In the same vein, we have uh, perhaps another example would be Instagram. Uh, Facebook uh, is a very complicated and like, I don't know ever, I don't understand how people could possibly get into Facebook today. When I open facebook.com, it's just a marvel of buttons, buttons bleh, galore and ads there and bleh, like, how would you ever understand that? Complexity has just grown to ludicrous levels there. And somewhere along the line, Instagram started getting popular and Facebook didn't own it at the time, but Instagram was just, it was everything Facebook wasn't. It was just post a picture, you can like it and you can kind of comment on it and uh, there's filters and that is that. It was so simple. Instagram had kind of identified one thing that was particularly good about Facebook and they had distilled it into one piece of software and, and did just that. Only they could do that uh, because Facebook could not do that themselves because if they started, do, even if they knew that uh, this thing was the, the best thing about the product, if they had just started removing features uh, <laughs> gradually, uh, it would, or changing into that gradually, uh, that would just have been a, a slow grinding torture for their user base and everybody would just hate them. Uh, but Instagram can do it because they were starting from scratch and once once people saw the nice cohesive experience that Instagram uh, offered, a lot of people started migrating to it and it had this enormous ludicrous user growth. Now I know Facebook had to acquire Instagram um, because they saw that the trajectory that Instagram had was just ah! But I think that Facebook could probably internally, hypothetically, could have done what Fog Creek Software did with Fogbox and, and Trello. Comment if you think that this is taking things too far and too out there, but isn't this kind of how nature works? Like death is part of life. As people, we grow old, we stagnate and we die for good reason. And uh, our children can take over with fresh new eyes and fresh new skills and without the baggage that we carry with us as, as the elders.
It's the circle of love. I'm kind of imagining like a monkey holding up no jazz. You know what? I'm gonna go fetch a, a board game. This turns into an impromptu ad for this fantastic game called Small World. Uh, you can you can buy it using the affiliate link in the description if you want to support the show. Uh, but what I wanted seriously, what I wanted to show is this mechanic. You you control these uh, these people, these races that enter the board from different uh, different places and, and they dominate uh, dominate those spaces. It's pretty cool. Uh, the the races are kind of semi-generated, so they can be stout giants or uh, or fortified giants or uh, forest humans. But the thing is that after a while, after a few turns, uh, your um, your people, your race, uh, they start getting weaker and they end up going into stagnation. So you turn them over. Uh, you still have them around, and they still uh, get uh, you still get points for them while they are still on the map. But uh, you you do get a new race. You generate a new race, sort of. For example, alchemist orcs, and you enter on the map on another plane, and you just race over another race. It's an interesting and brutal uh, analogy to software development. Uh, small world, great game. Every game by Days of Wonder is amazing. It's so so pretty and well illustrated. I really recommend it. And that's my thought of the day. Wasn't it wonderfully uplifting? Your software complexity will inevitably grow over time until it stagnates and dies. However, I do really think that there is hope in embracing this circle of life and being the facilitator of, of your own product killers, so to speak, instead of waiting for a, uh, for a competitor to do it for you. And that's my thoughts. If you have any experience on this, po please post, post, post it in a comment down below. Uh, you have just watched an episode of Fun Fun Function. I release these every Monday morning, 0800 GMT. If you don't want to wait until next Monday, you can watch this video that uh, the Google prediction algorithms that are actually just completely arbitrary have selected for you. I am MPJ. Until next Monday morning, stay curious.